Welcome to Healthline 3, everyone. I'm Johnette Magner. And joining us now to discuss joint issues and especially minimally invasive joint replacements is Dr. Vic Chatrath. He is an orthopedic surgeon with Bozier Orthopedics, which is affiliated with Willis Knight and Bozier. And we will be taking your calls throughout this 30 minute show. As a reminder, please make sure that you are in a quiet room when you call with your TV turned all the way down. Our number is 318-219-4569. And if you call, you can speak to Dr. Chatrath directly about any concerns you have regarding today's topics. So welcome, welcome Thank Dr. You. Chatrath. It's Thank great you. to have you with us. So let's start with what I would call the real basics. What are our joints and what do they do? Absolutely. So our joints basically help us to move, be flexible, and carry out everyday living. In technical terms, we call them ADLs, activities of daily living. And that's what I focus on in my practice, uh, not only in providing joint replacement surgery, but helping people in staying healthy with their joints and trying to preserve their joints as much as possible. So are joint problems common and where are they most likely to occur? So joint replacement or sorry, joint problems are becoming more common by the day. Uh, the reason is we're active, but on the other end of the spectrum, our population is getting larger, right? So obesity also plays a big part in it. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we are seeing a lot and lot of joint problems every single day. Uh, the most common joints that it affects are hip, knees, and shoulder joints. These are the three most common ones that we see, and especially in my practice, that's what I focus on as well. I would assume that hips and knees are the ones most affected by obesity. Yes, because they're the weight-bearing joint, they are the most commonly uh, affected by arthritis or osteoarthritis, as we call it. So talk about weight a little bit more and joints. If someone were to lose 20 pounds, mm -hmm. would that have a meaningful impact on their joints? Absolutely, so the way the physics works is very interesting. If you drop 20 pounds, you're actually decreasing the joint load by 40 pounds, so it's double the way the physics works on it. Wow. Yeah. So that means when you put on 20 pounds, you're actually adding 40 pounds to your joints. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's very interesting of how that works. And then a lot of times people will come back to us and say, I've lost a lot of weight and my joints are actually feeling really good. Really? Yeah. Wow, okay. So um, our, let's see, joint problems are associated with aging. Mm -hmm. But do particular behaviors as well put you at higher risk? I'm thinking in terms of runners or certain occupations, that kind of thing. So that's a great question. So this has always been a debate whether, you know, marathon runners or people who run long distance, whether they're going to have more joint problems than others. And most studies have come out with the fact that running uh, does not really cause your joint to wear out. Okay, as long as it is not extreme, it's not very high impact. So the most common way to stay healthy, have good joint health, is to do low impact running. And for if you want to do a 5K or 10K, that's actually quite reasonable. Even coming up to marathon runners, the studies have shown that it's not made a difference. Now, where it does make a difference is activities which involve a lot of cutting sports, a lot of impact sports. Mm -hmm. CrossFit is one of them. I see a lot mm -hmm. of CrossFit injuries uh, coming my way and uh, they happen because of the cutting motion you end up getting a tear in the knee. The most common form a meniscal tear or you would have heard an ACL tear, a ligament tear. Yeah, we've, right? we've heard of that yeah. certainly. Then certainly we see sports injuries but that's not to discourage anybody from saying hey please don't participate. I would rather say be healthy, keep exercising, um, keep the weight under control rather than go the other extreme. So when it comes to your joints, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, and, and um, we talk a lot about on this show about BMI mm -hmm. and healthy BMI. What is there, is, is that really the number that you use and go by with respect to that range when you talk about 
joints or, or do you all have a different recommendation when it comes to joint health? So a BMI is a little bit of a flawed concept, mm -hmm. uh, especially because I practiced in Minnesota quite a lot. I had a lot of patients of Norwegian heritage. So having somebody who was 6'6 six, six mm -hmm. and just large, but not obese, was not uncommon. So their BMI would be high, but we're still talking within a reasonable range. If we talk technical, there is something called a bell curve, okay? Mm -hmm. A bell curve means most of the population falls within this group. So as long as we use the bell curve and some common sense attached to it, mm -hmm. I think we're okay. So not everybody has to be 25, 24 BMI, okay? We are 30 BMI, 32 BMI, 35 BMI, we are okay. Once we start pushing past 40, yeah. that's when we are really getting into trouble. Not only joint health, but as a physician, I would say all kinds of medical issues. Right. Now, if you are heavier mm -hmm. and you decide you, you want to lose weight mm -hmm. and part of your new plan, new you, includes activity mm -hmm. and you haven't been doing any, what do you advise in terms of uh, preventing joint injuries? That's a great question. I really uh, enjoyed this question because I discuss this with my patients quite a bit. They come, hey, doctor, I'm 45 BMI. I know I need new knees, but I need to lose weight to qualify for the operation. But my knees hurt, what do I do? So what you do is you do low impact activity, okay? Which means you can do something like yoga, Tai Chi, swimming. Oh, I love swimming. Yeah, cycling. So basically you're not putting your body weight and pounding on the joint constantly. It's low impact. Mm -hmm. The other powerful tool that really works, I actually tell my patients, please go buy a journal. And mm -hmm. some patients do that. They'll buy a journal. I said, write down for a week everything you ate. It is so powerful. Then you look oh, at it. Yeah. Wow, I should not have done this. I should not have done this. Mm -hmm. And I had a lady, I obviously can't say her name, I'm so proud of her. She lost 65 pounds wow. and I did her minimally invasive hip replacement and it's gone amazing, fantastic. It's been a life changer for her. She's so happy. I feel a personal pride in it. And you should, yeah. that's wonderful. Well, it, it appears we have a caller right now. Pamela, welcome to the show. What is your, what is your question for us? I want the doctor to talk about minimally invasive knee surgery. Who qualifies and how is it done? Great question. In fact, that was going to be one of the questions I asked. So thank you for calling and, and asking. Why don't you go ahead and address that, please? Thank sir. you, Pamela. You stole our question there. <laughs> <laughs> so minimally invasive joint replacement basically means if I don't know if the camera can point to my knee, mm -hmm. um, the traditional way of doing joint replacement surgery is to make a cut here on the skin and then we cut the muscle which is called the quadriceps muscle, okay? What I do in my practice is, for most reasonably sized patients, we make the skin cut, we don't cut the muscle. We go beneath the muscle, take the whole muscle to a side. And at the end of the surgery, all we do is we put the muscle back. So there is no scarring in the muscle and the recovery is extremely fast with it. It's a special approach for which I received training. It's called the subvastus approach, okay? On combination with that, we use robotics. So the robot is just like a GPS. Uh, for example, right now on the, in the studio, there are three robotic cameras which are looking at us and helping us do the show. Mm -hmm. Just like that, we have robots in surgery as well, which are so precise that they can measure things at a millimeter's breadth, like that of my nail, or 0.5 millimeter, I should say. And that really helps be accurate. I don't have to make long cuts. What are the benefits? Less scarring, faster recovery. Um, Who qualifies? Almost everybody within a reasonable size. Okay? If you're too heavy or too large, then we do have to go to a standard technique. Otherwise, most of the other patients, we can do that. Okay, Pamela, oh, you have a follow-up question, I bet. Yes, um, and everyone qualifies for it who is not too heavy, right? Yes. Do you want to talk uh, at all about your specific issue and what you're feeling? And well, I had one knee done the traditional way, and the other one might need to be done, and I'm not going through that traditional thing again. It was painful. The recovery took a long time. So well, if I have to have it done again, I'm looking into the minimal invasive. 
Well, I, I, I hope is that we, reasonable? I hope we're able to help you with that. And uh, if uh, you know you want to visit with me, I would go into further detail with you and uh, show you models of how we do this in clinic and uh, discuss this with you. I would love to do that. Thank do you very much. I you, appreciate it. Do you want to give her your phone number? Uh, so it's 318-212-7841. I'm sorry if I went fast. The best way is uh, Google Bozier Orthopedics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bozier Orthopedics. We can, yeah, we'll, we'll all remember that one. So Pamela, I have a, another question for you. Actually, how long ago did you have your other knee done? I had it done at the end of August, 1st of September. Okay, and it just took a, a really long time for you to reply, to recover and, and, and be mobile? Yes. yes, I had good physical therapy, but the, re the recovery was months, <laughs> and I'm not going to do that again. Okay, so why don't you talk about what it sounds like her situation maybe was a, a bit of an outlier did she that she had did she have more difficulty than than most do yes i would say so um, i mean I, I i apologize that it happened to you it's a little unfortunate but i hope you have a faster recovery on the other side and um, i don't know the exact circumstances without mm -hmm. going into details but most patients do not take this long to recover by Honestly, if somebody had their surgery in August, I saw my follow-up patients today, actually, before I came to the show, and really at this point, they're coming to give me a hug. Mm -hmm. or, or to tell me, hey, I'm doing great, I'm going on a cruise, and uh, or they're coming to book their next one gotcha. on the other side. So really at this point, uh, we, uh, it's, we call this, it's more of a social visit to clinic. <laughs> they, they come to just uh, you know, tell us how good they're doing. Okay, it appears we have another caller now, Alma. Is that the correct name? Alma. It is. Okay, yes, please, go ahead. I have a history of uh, knee problems, and doctor, in 2017, my knee was accidentally crushed. I had a surgery, a replacement done uh, in 2018 in the spring. That knee had, that, that replacement got infected, and for the last, say, four years after that, uh, they they kept putting a block in the knee instead of the, the replacement until trying to get the infection out. The last surgery was last year, which was the fifth one. They went in, they opened the leg up, and they burnt the infection out, I was told, and then replaced the second replacement knee. So now that knee is kind of uh, flexing. I think you call it goes back to first, so I'm in a break. They're telling me now that if you go back in the knee and if it get infected, they have to cut the knee off. If anything you're paying or you might can do to, to get me out of this situation, I don't, you know, I mean, I I, I see other people with, with knee replacement, they're having no problems, they're walking, they're running, and they just did it a few months ago. Here I am five years and I'm still having a knee problem. Okay, what do All you right. have for him? Yeah, so this, uh, this is an uh, unfortunate complication. This has happened and it's lasted a long time. Now, part of my role uh, as a joint replacement surgeon, I'm a fellowship joint surgeon, which means I take on complicated cases mm -hmm. where these situations have happened, oh. where people have had multiple surgeries. I just had a lady referred to me in a similar situation last week and we're going to help her, okay? Uh, but in your situation, really, I have to sit down with you. Uh, please make an appointment. Uh, we would really have to go over the details. In fact, probably a good idea to send all the stuff to me in advance. So when I meet you, I've actually okay. had a chance to look at it and uh, go over the details and discuss all available options. Uh, it's, not an, it's not the easy option, like when somebody, Mrs. Jones, comes to me for a knee replacement and we do a minimally, I don't think we're going to go discuss those options with you, uh, but we're going to go over all the details and I'll try to help you the best I can. That sounds good to me. So Thank do you. Do you think that is a possible chance through? I mean, I know you can't guarantee anything maybe, but and your knowledge that there is another option than cutting my leg off. No, we're not jumping into that. Uh, we're going to look at every single option that is possible, every single option. 
My business is saving legs, not cutting off legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good enough, Doctor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. You know, when he talked about possibly losing uh, an, an amputation, amputation is does diabetes have any relationship to joint issues? You know, it interferes with so many different things. Yes. And I, you know, when I, I think about having to have something like that cut off, I often think of diabetics. Yes. So uh, diabetics have a higher chance of getting an infection. So what we do is uh, we have a strict protocol where we monitor their A1C. So essentially, before surgery, when they come to visit with us, we involve the family doctor as well, okay? And we check their A1C to make sure that their blood sugars are controlled. Like, uh, again, can't take names, but I have a gentleman who really needs a hip replacement. His diabetes is not well controlled. So we said, okay, let's re revisit in three months. He's going to talk to his family doctor. They're going to look at some other options for him and get his blood sugars under control, and then we'll do a hip replacement for him. Gotcha. Okay, it appears we have another caller. And the name again, please? Ricky. Ricky. Okay, Ricky. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, I was wondering, I had a knee replacement, and um, I had to go back and have it redone again because the plastic piece they put in the middle was like six, min six millimeters smaller than what it should have been. How often does that happen? Okay, so uh, how this can happen, uh, this has happened in the past more commonly, but it is getting a lot better, okay? I see these complications come when, I'll, I'll speak a little freely. <laughs> uh, I see these complications come along when uh, people who don't do a lot of joint replacements end up doing them. Uh, joint replacements, like any other profession in the world, is a question of numbers. You have to do a lot of them mm -hmm. to stay good at it and to recognize that there is a problem. If you don't do many, uh, these situations can arise. And that's where uh, I do a lot of what we call revision surgeries or redo surgeries, where we go in, we fix these complications which have unfortunately happened with other places. And um, one of the best ways in my practice of how I avoid it I am to the point of being OCD about using my robotics to make sure that my knee replacements are perfectly balanced and we don't run into these situations. All right, do you have a follow-up question, Ricky? Um, yeah, um, what is the revision surgery? Does it last, I mean, it's just like a first-time surgery when they go in to do the revision. That's what I had done. Uh, no, revision surgeries are not like a first-time surgery. They always have uh, a higher rate of complications. Reason being, you're cutting into a tissue which has already had scar. So I'm not uh, talking about your particular situation, but in general, they have a higher risk of getting an infection, higher risk of the wound breaking down. So in general, revision surgeries are fraught with more risk. So my goal is to get it right the first time, and I don't <laughs> want to revise it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes good sense. All right, Ricky, do you yeah. have any other questions for the doctor? Um, yeah, I do one more. Why, what is the pain behind my kneecap that I have? Uh, so, interestingly, when we do the knee replacement surgery, there is a difference in philosophy. Most of the European doctors don't tend to replace kneecaps. In America, probably 80% of doctors will replace kneecaps, and I am one of them, I replace kneecaps. We see that patients who don't get their kneecap replaced do tend to have a higher incidence of knee pain in the front of the knee, which is called anterior knee pain, what you're describing. So I don't want to take that chance even for 2% or 1% of my patients. So I just don't, as I said, I'm an OCD individual, which is what you want your surgeon to be. <laughs> and I don't want to take a right. chance on it. And so I replace that in all my knee replacements. So should I think about getting the knee replaced, the knee count? Uh, I will have to really look at your x-ray to see if that was done or not. Sometimes if the yeah. kneecap was replaced and the thickness, like I measure it to a millimeter. If yes. the measurement was not done accurately, it's too thick or too thin, even that right. can affect knee pain. Okay. Okay, well, um, give me a little while and I'll probably call you on in a couple months. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you.
So how do you know if um, uh, you have a joint situation that warrants a visit to the doctor? So if you have tried simple home things, and you know, again, we, we're all human. I won't go to the doctor on my, the first day I get a sprain, okay? Mm -hmm. You have tried a brace, you've tried some ibuprofen, you've tried activity modification that I'm going to rest my knee, I'm going to rest my hip, I'm going to ice it a little bit, go talk to the family doctor, okay, I'm not getting anywhere, mm -hmm. okay? That's the time, okay, let's go visit with the surgeon and see what's going on and uh, find out more about it. Maybe time to get an x-ray. Occasionally we get MRIs, depending on the complexity of the situation. How do you know if the difference, uh, I'm gonna use a really funny example here. Mm -hmm. I rode on a Mardi Gras float this mm -hmm. weekend and I threw beads for four hours and my arm hurts. Sure, <laughs> sure. I'm assuming it's just, you know, I, said I, I think I felt like a kid trying out for baseball pitcher right, or right. something. So how do you know when it's just sore muscles versus a joint? So, you know, like you said, it, you did it on the weekend. Here we are on Tuesday, it's mm -hmm. only 48 hours. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a friend, not as a doctor, I would say, hey, put some ice on it, try some Advil, give it a break for a few days. If you'd like going to the gym and lifting weights, maybe back off from that. And if in two weeks it's not getting better, well, give me a call. Gotcha, okay, that's a good rule. All right, we have another caller, Celeste. Welcome to the show. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Please speak a little louder for me if you don't mind. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm uh, 81 years old, and I'm a diabetic, and I have a left knee problem. And uh, sometimes uh, my left knee hurts, and if I stay off of it a while, it, it gets better. Okay. All right, and I think you probably need to turn your TV down because you're hearing yourself a little late and it makes it so difficult to talk and ask questions and hear us. Um, okay, so you're diabetic and you've got knee pain. Are you wondering what you need to do? And plus I'm 81 years old and I'm a right. diabetic. Okay. okay, so uh, one of the things we do is, it looks like what you're describing is that the pain does go away after a few days and then comes back. So you may have something what we call early arthritis and it may not be to a point where you need an operation. Having said that, we take care of all joint issues, or the entire spectrum from early to end stage arthritis. Where, and we can help you with getting injections in the knee joint sometimes medications in the knee joints, bracing, physical therapy. So what we do is we start by examining you, getting x-rays done, and depending on your unique situation, I would tailor that to you. Is that helpful to you? Yes, it is, yes it is. Okay, do you have any more questions for us? No, I'll call this office and make an appointment. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> calling too. Glad you're with us. Um, minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. So take me through, um, a, I would say, an average, typical uh, patient situation from coming to see you, what you do, okay. the recovery time, the process, so that, the, so that our viewers have a real picture of what they mm -hmm. would be committing to if they went through with it. Okay. So we spoke a little bit about knees. I'm gonna speak about hips now. Great, okay. okay. So I'm gonna stand up for a second. Uh -huh. A traditional hip replacement surgery was always done by cutting the butt muscle right here, mm -hmm. okay? And a large cut, six to eight inches, we would cut the butt. So I don't do it like that. We do it through the front. We don't cut the muscle, we go between the muscle, okay? So that right away decreases your recovery time in half. It's less scarring, less bleeding. This is called the direct anterior approach hip replacement, okay? Uh, I was super lucky because the guy who trained me uh, 12 years ago was the individual who worked with the person who brought anterior hip replacements to the country. Oh my goodness. So yes. uh, I was like a grandchild of mm -hmm. those guys in a way. So I consider myself very lucky to having trained with those guys. So last 12 years, that's what I've been doing. 
Now, what it does is it helps us to use the x-ray machine while performing the operation. In the traditional way, you do the hip replacement, you take an x-ray after the job has been done. Well, now you can't do anything about it if you don't like it. Okay? Mm -hmm. You've done the surgery, you walked out. Here, I'm doing the uh, operation, checking an x-ray. Hey, I don't like this position. I'm going to change the position by five degrees. Mm -hmm. I will do that till I am happy. I will not walk out of the operating room till I'm satisfied. Okay. Plus, we do it through that small cut which I spoke about, which is not cutting across the muscle, but going between the muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the main benefit is the scarring really goes down. Okay. And it helps the patients. So most patients are able to walk two hours after surgery. They're able to walk two hours yeah. after surgery. So the physical therapist will come. Let's just say you mm -hmm. had a hip replacement. Okay. The therapist will come to the recovery room. As soon as the numbing medication is gone, they will help you get up with a walker. They will make you walk. And you will walk. Uh, majority of my patients uh, who are in good health, I'm not talking the joint, I'm saying other medical conditions, right. and have family support, are able to go home the same day. So they have their joint replacement in the morning, in the evening they go home. And uh, by two weeks, their sutures, staples come out. By four to five weeks, most of the hips are doing really, really good. And uh, uh, by the six to eight week mark, they're actually back to work. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's so great. that makes the process, because rem I remember even when I was a medical student doing my orthopedic rotations, following other orthopedic surgeons, learning how to do this, patients used to stay in the hospital for four to seven days after joint replacement surgery. Yeah. We used to keep visiting with them for almost a week, and now uh, they're going home the same day. So things have changed a lot with minimally invasive. Wow, that, I mean, that's a completely different recovery time. Yes. And um, I, I bet there are a lot of people out there, though, who don't appreciate how different it is today than from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, because everybody's heard the stories of 20 years ago. Yeah. So we talked about issues like weight mm -hmm. and being a problem at times. What is the minimum age that, and the maximum age? Do you have a cutoff where you say, if you're younger than this or older than this, it's not gonna work? So typically we try to do joint replacement surgery in people above 60, okay? Having said that, we run into situations where a 40-year-old had previous uh, injuries to the knee. Their knee resembles that of a 60-year-old. Now, I can't tell them to wait 20 years, right. okay? Because that's the most functional period of their life. They have to make a living. They have to enjoy their life. So we will do a joint replacement. Now, what is the premise? Why don't we do a joint replacement at someone who's 40? The reason is it's a man-made object, okay? Mm -hmm. Just like a car tire, it has X number of miles on it. So with the technology that we have, we estimate it will last 20, 25 years, okay? You do this in a 40-year-old, you will have to do a redo. Gotcha. You so what does the 40-year-old then do unt between then and that time when you say let's replace it? What are the, There are obviously treatments for pain and discomfort Absolutely. and inflammation. Absolutely. And we try them to the maximum and we do a joint replacement surgery only we've tried everything injections physical therapy bracing medicine weight loss activity modification sometimes i'll put a scope or a camera and clean it out you failed all this then comes the time to hey is this bad enough that it's impacting your livelihood you can't play with your friends family kids well let's do a joint replacement then all right, so we just have one minute left. Please tell everyone where you're located, how they can find you, because it sounds like we've got a number of people who called in today that are gonna be knocking on your door pretty quickly. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. I'm with willis Knighton Health System. I'm located in Bossier and at the Bossier campus. So please feel free to make an appointment uh, with us. We are at the medical pavilion and uh, we'll be happy to help you. And you're right off 220, correct? Correct. All right. Okay, well, thank you so very much for joining us today. This was really interesting. I, I learned a lot, and I have a, my feeling the viewers learned a whole well, lot, Well, thank too. you so much. I always enjoy coming and talking about joint replacement. That's my passion. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not only a living, it's something I'm very passionate about, and I take personal pride in it, and I enjoy it quite a lot. All right, and thank you to all of you for joining us for Healthline 3. We hope you have a great afternoon.